Um, <clears throat> uh, hello and welcome. My name is Alicia Arian, and I'm the Newhouse Visiting Professor of Creative Writing here at Wellesley. Um, the first thing I need to announce is that this discussion is being recorded and will be available online as a webcast on the WGBH Forum Network at www.wgbh.org slash forum. Uh, we welcome everyone who is listening and watching online. Um, the second thing I'd like to say is that the English department very gratefully acknowledges the support of the writing program and the Wilson Fund uh, of the Committee on Lectures and Cultural Events in helping to bring Tom Parada here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm new to Wellesley this year, and one of the many things uh, I find impressive about the college is the way in which different departments and committees come together to make sure that each semester there are vital events such as this one. Um, my personal connection to Tom Parada is kind of an important one to me. Um, he was the first author to blurb my first book. Uh, I remember the day my editor called to tell me what nice things he'd said and how baffled I felt. Uh, thrilled but baffled. I wasn't quite sure how my book had landed in the hands of someone whose work I admired so greatly. A lot of writers admire Tom Parada's work greatly. Uh, I hesitate to call him a writer's writer because sometimes that can mean that you're really good, but you don't sell books. Um, Tom sells books big time. But he is a writer's writer in the sense that he does the thing that we all hope to accomplish in our work. He makes stuff happen, and he makes it happen so that you feel it, and he makes it happen so that you feel it without a 300-page buildup. I would venture to say that the events in the first three chapters of Little Children, Tom's latest novel, end up making you both gasp and establish immediate and intense expectations for the rest of the book, all in the space of a very economical 37 pages. And trust me, those expectations won't go unfulfilled. What's great about Tom Parada's fiction is his deep understanding that not only should the short story be concentrated and succinct, but so should the novel. He holds himself to the highest standard of engagement, and we, his lucky readers, are the ones who reap the benefits. Tom Parada has been called the American Chekhov by the New York Times. The Christian Science Monitor states that with little children, he has moved into the suburbs with a wrecking ball. Dennis Lehane, author of Mystic River, states plainly on the back of little children that he wishes he had written the book himself. On top of all of this praise, I can tell you that Tom is also a wonderful person to call your friend. I'm delighted that he's here today to read from his latest brilliant novel. Please help me welcome Tom Parada. Well, thank you, Alicia. That, that's really sweet. This is um, my second time here at Wellesley this year, so it's kind of uh, starting to feel a little bit at home. It's, but to be here under the circumstances is very nice, uh, kind of a personal triumph because I applied here for an undergrad <laughs> and was rejected. So it's a kind of a, you know, a sense of vindication to be invited back. Um, so thank you, Wellesley. So, um, so when, when uh, I, th I thought about this, you know, what, what should I read here? And, and part of it is I've been reading from little children for almost a year now, and so... Yeah, no, it's, it, I know. I get a little tired of the, the sections. And th there was a section that, that I have never read before that seemed like it might be interesting um, uh, for, for this group. Pardon me. Um, but it's well into the book, so I just need to give you a, a little bit of background. And basically, Little Children is a story about a stay-at-home mom and a stay-at-home dad who meet at the playground and start this torrid affair that... that um, you know, basically, the book is the history of this affair and, and you know, just how far is it going to go. Um, there's a subplot that doesn't affect what I'm going to read today, which is about there's a child molester in the town where they live, and, and the parents are very upset about his presence. And so there's a whole sense of, of menace lurking in the background of what is kind of a dark suburban sex comedy in, in the foreground. Um, 
so th that's that's where we are. Basically, the affair is well underway at the point of the chapter I'm going to read you, which is called Book Group. Um, Sarah is the main character. And what you really need to know about right now, she's involved with, with a guy named Todd, and the affair has um, gotten very quickly very serious. Um, and there's a woman named Marianne who's her great nemesis from the playground. Um, so I, I, if there's anything else you need to know, I will, uh, I'll fill you in as I go. But I think that's it for now. Um, Jean, who I'm going to mention right away, is uh, a 60-year-old woman, Sarah's neighbor, and they, they go on evening fitness walks. For weeks now, on their nightly walks, Jean had been bugging Sarah about Madame Bovary. Had she obtained a copy of the Stigmuller translation? Had she started reading it yet? Had she given any thought to the five discussion questions each little sister had been asked to contribute to the book group meeting? Until a couple of days ago, the answer to all these questions had been a resounding no. Because she felt like she was being railroaded. To the best of her knowledge, she had never actually agreed to be Jean's little sister. Sarah had avoided the novel for as long as possible in the hope that an unexpected circumstance would arise and free her from the obligation. Maybe her husband would get sent on a last minute business trip or her daughter would catch a cold. Maybe she herself would go blind or get run over by a bus. It wasn't just the book group she dreaded. It was the book itself. She had read Madame Bovary in college for a seminar, seminar called Sexism in Literature, which cataloged the multifarious strategies male writers had used throughout the ages to oppress and marginalize their female characters. Emma Bovary was Exhibit A, right up there with Ophelia and Isabel Archer, a dreamy, passive, narcissistic figure enthralled by paralyzing bourgeois notions of love and happiness, utterly and indiscriminately dependent upon men to rescue her from the emptiness of her useless life. To make matters worse, she turned her back on the empowering consolations of sisterhood. She had no female friends, mistreated her little servant girl, and, uh, mistreated her servant girl and wet nurse, and neglected her poor little daughter. Even if Sarah had been inclined to revisit this depressing, sub, this depressing material, it wouldn't have been easy. Despite its racy subject matter, Madame Bovary was densely written and slowly paced. Like any 19th century novel, it placed serious demands upon the reader's time and concentration. Ever since she'd begun her affair with Todd, Sarah had developed some sort of adult onset attention deficit disorder. She'd pick up the newspaper and get maybe two paragraphs into an article before finding herself completely at sea, the words on the page dissolving into a fantasy of travel. Just herself and Todd, no children, complete freedom, two lovers laughing on a crowded bus in India, sipping champagne in a first-class train compartment in Europe, barreling down the interstate in a red convertible, singing along with the radio. She turned back to the paper and reread the same two paragraphs, only to be waylaid by a daydream of grocery shopping, cruising down the aisles of bread and circus with Todd at her side, filling a cart with organic produce, fresh pasta, free-range chicken, sinful desserts, Australian wine. She'd force her attention back on the paper with a feeling of growing annoyance. What did she care about a shark attack in Florida, rolling blackouts in California, George W. Bush's love affair with his Texas ranch? All she wanted to think about was hiding in the balcony of an old-fashioned movie palace, Todd's hand inching up her thigh as the cavalry charged across a western landscape. Finally, she just tossed aside the paper and turned on the TV, which seemed so much more accommodating to her fantasy life and not nearly so judgmental. Knowing that she was no match for Flaubert, she'd resigned herself to winging it at the meeting, skimming the novel for an hour or two, scrawling down a handful of boilerplate questions, keeping her mouth shut during the group discussion. But then something happened on Saturday morning that put her in a serious funk. In an effort to distract herself, she picked up Madame Bovary 
and discovered an entirely different novel from the one that existed in her memory. What does your wife look like? Todd seemed surprised by the question, at least partly because he was licking Sarah's navel when she asked it. My wife? The woman living in your house, Sarah said, attempting to make a joke out of a subject that had become a source of obsessive speculation on her part, the one you sleep with every night. What does she look like? Todd repeated skeptically. I'm just curious, that's all. After several evasive maneuvers, Todd attempted to describe Kathy as if she were a criminal suspect. Five nine, straight brown hair, brown eyes, no visible scars or tattoos. But Sarah remained unsatisfied. Is she pretty? He gave the matter some serious consideration, as if it were open to debate. Sarah found this encouraging. I guess so, he said. Objectively speaking, um, one thing you need to know at this point is Todd is an extremely good-looking guy, and Sarah doesn't think of herself as a particularly attractive woman, so she's sort of amazed that this guy is with her at all. So this is, this is what's underlying this um, speculation on her part. I guess so, he said, objectively speaking. Is she a knockout? We're married. I don't think about her like that. What about other guys? If they saw her walking down the street, would they think she was hot? Depends on the guy, I guess. Do you have a picture? In a transparent attempt to distract her, Todd kissed her from the base of her throat down to her sternum. With a gentle tug on her bikini top, he freed her left breast, flicking his tongue playfully at her nipple, waking it from its afternoon slumber. Come on, she persisted. You must have one in your wallet. Jesus, Todd looked up in bewilderment. Why is this so important to you? Sarah felt a warm flush of shame surging into her face. She knew it was a bad sign, this jealousy she was feeling toward a woman she'd never met, who'd never done anything to hurt her. I don't know, she confessed wondering if she was about to burst into tears. I wish it wasn't. Todd pressed a finger to his lip, shushing her as if she were a small child. Looking straight into her eyes, he slipped his other hand inside the waistband of her bikini bottom and reached between her thighs, cupping her gently from below. It always came as a shock when he touched her like that, the pleasure of it so much more intense than she'd anticipated. She opened her legs to give him more room. She's a knockout, he confessed. But beauty's overrated. At the time, Sarah barely registered the comment, giving herself up to the strong sensations flooding her body. Later that night, though, it came back to her. Beauty's overrated. He'd meant it to be comforting, but at three in the morning, it had precisely the opposite effect. He had a beautiful wife, a knockout, and she was sleeping beside him right now, their legs intertwined beneath the covers. And where was Sarah? Wide awake in the dark, listening to the wheezy, tedious breathing of the man she no longer considered her husband. Beauty's overrated. Only someone who took his own beauty for granted could have been able to say something so outrageously stupid with a straight face. Richard, Sarah's husband, liked to sleep in on the weekends. He was still in bed when Sarah left the house on Sunday morning, on Saturday morning, leaving Lucy in front of the TV with a big bowl of dry Cheerios for company and instructions to wake Daddy if she needed anything. Mommy has to run some errands, she said. Her first stop was Starbucks, a journey back in time she preferred to avoid whenever possible. Uh, Sarah's last job before she got married and had kids was working at Starbucks. For years after, oh, that's right here. For years after she stopped working there. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm better than I thought. Uh, for years after she stopped working there, just a glimpse of that tasteful beige and maroon interior, the bags of featured coffee, 
The shell was full of upscale accessories. The customers lined up like addicts at a yuppie methadone clinic to throw off her whole day, stirring up a sediment of bad memories that otherwise lay dormant in her mental attic, covered by several protective layers of dust. She used to feel the same way about her old high school, devising all sorts of elaborate detours to keep from having to lay eyes on it. But she'd slept badly and was suffering from a low-level headache that only a serious dose of caffeine could cure. Menti House, she said to the girl at the register, a punky earth mother with a jet black page boy and a tongue stud. Menti House, the girl repeated a moment later, sliding the gigantic paper cup across the counter. Don't worry. Sarah smiled in rueful solidarity. You won't work here forever. It's not that bad, the girl said, eyeing Sarah with suspicion, as if she were some sort of troublemaker. Todd's address, Sarah had learned from the phone book, was 24 Angelina Way. She found the place without much difficulty and parked across the street in front of number 19 in what felt to her like an unobtrusive patch of shade beneath a maple tree. Sipping her coffee and listening to NPR's weekend edition, she settled back in her seat and stared at the house where her boyfriend lived. It was nothing special. What would have been an average-sized colonial if it hadn't been divided into two mirror image condos, powder blue with pale yellow trim. Instead of a lawn, there was a large driveway sloping down to a two-car the two-basement gar two basement garage. On either side of the driveway, cement walks led to the respective entrances, identical except for the fact that one said 24 and the other 26. Sarah shouldn't have been surprised to find Todd living in a duplex with a beat-up Toyota on his side of the driveway. She knew that his wife supported the family with some kind of low-paying work as a documentary filmmaker for public TV. But the house just didn't fit into her idea of his stature in the grand scheme of things. He carried himself like a natural aristocrat, a person for whom nice things came as easily as good looks. In some fundamental way, it didn't make sense that someone as unremarkable as she was should be living in a bigger house in a better neighborhood than Todd. It wasn't an awful house, not by a long stretch. It had skylights and scalloped woodwork over the front doors and windows the sort of small touches that marked it as a quality home, modest though it was. Maybe it felt right for them to be living there at that particular point in their lives. Maybe it was even romantic in a way to be a young family together, sharing burdens, moving up in the world. Years from now, Todd and Kathy would be able to drive Aaron down Angelina Way and say, there's the old condo. Can you ever believe we lived like that? Sarah had skipped that particular phase of life, moving straight from a shared apartment with annoying roommates into a mini Victorian full of furniture from Pottery Barn. And she couldn't help resenting Kathy for the fact that she got to suffer with Todd through their lean years, creating a history that they could look back on with pride and maybe even nostalgia. Unless he leaves her, she thought, her chest swelling with a strange feeling of lightness. Unless he leaves her to be with me, it wasn't the first time she'd let herself consider this scenario, but it was the first time she'd let herself believe it was a real possibility. He could divorce Kathy. He could marry me. I could divorce Richard. Todd could marry me. She kept extending the sequence, playing out the permutations, imagining the logistics to the best of her ability, the lawyers, the custody battles, the financial arrangements, the emotional trauma, until Todd startled her by stepping out the front door, hugging a picnic cooler to his chest, his brow furrowed with worry. He can divorce her. He carried the plastic box down the steps and placed it in the trunk of the Toyota. I can divorce him. It took all of the self-restraint she possessed to stay inside the car, to keep herself from running over to him and shouting out the wonderful news. We can divorce them and marry each other. He made three trips in all, beach umbrella, toy pail and shovel, two canvas totes, a football, and it just shut the trunk when Aaron emerged from the front door, looking serious and oddly unfamiliar without his jester's cap, and joined his father by the car. 
Kathy stepped out into the sunlight a moment later. She was barefoot, wearing tight blue jean shorts, a black bikini top, and Italian movie star sunglasses, looking taller, thinner, and more glamorous than Sarah had let herself imagine in her worst self-loathing insomniac nightmare. She was one of those girls, the ones from high school who made you stick your finger down your throat after lunch, the ones who made you look in the mirror and cry. Kathy stood on the porch for a long time, giving Sarah a fair chance to contemplate her folly. She interlaced her fingers overhead and tilted her lithe torso from side to side. Then she spread her arms wide and yawned, the way people do when they're sleepy but happy and ready to embrace the day. Okay, boys, she called out. Let's get moving. Sarah felt herself deflating. Oh, God. Her dream of happiness suddenly seemed cruel, a joke she'd played on herself. I'll never leave her. She barely managed to hold herself together until Todd and his family had backed out of the driveway and headed off down the street. Not for me. She covered her mouth politely with one hand, as if she were coughing instead of sobbing. Not for anyone like me. Long after she'd stopped crying, Sarah sat in the parked car on Angelina Way, wondering how she was going to get through the next two days. Weekends were brutal under the best of circumstances. 48-hour prison stretches separating one happy blur of weekdays from the next. Uh, weekdays are when she's able to see Todd. They, um, they conduct their affair while their kids are sleeping. Uh, they have a nap at late afternoon, so that's, that's when they're free. Um, but this one was going to be unbearable now that she'd be able to torment herself with the thought of Todd spending every second of it in the company of his gorgeous wife at the beach no less while she was stuck at home with the panty sniffer. Oh, that's her husband. He's developed a fetish for an internet porn queen. Um, that's a little footnote. Um, Richard was sitting on the front lawn with Lucy when she pulled into the driveway, and just the sight of him filled her with disgust. His pleated shorts and Italian sandals, the polo shirt with the collar turned up as if it were 1988 on Nantucket, his little pot belly. They were having a tea party around a red and white checkered tablecloth, along with one of those hideous American girl dolls and a stuffed frog named, named Melvin. Both the doll and the miniature ceramic tea set were gifts from Richard's mother, a woman who still believed that dainty and ladylike were the conditions to which all little girls should aspire. He looked up from the game as she approached, a demi-toss of nothing raised halfway between a saucer and his mouth, his pinky sticking out with a primness that didn't seem satirical. Where were you, he asked, his face artfully blank, no hint of accusation in his voice. Ever since the incident in, the, in his office is when Sarah found him with the panties, he'd been a lot less imperious around the house, a little more considerate of his wife and child. I had some things to do, she said. You could have left a note. I didn't know if you were coming back in 15 minutes or two hours. You're lucky I'm back at all, she thought. She looked from Richard to Lucy, smiling as if touched by the sight of them. Well, I'm glad to see you two having so much fun. I think you needed a little father-daughter bonding time. He nodded as if to concede her the round. It's been wonderful, he said, but I was hoping you could take over in a few minutes. I have some work to do for that Chinese restaurant account. The presentation's next week. Could you do it later, she said. I need a little time to myself. Sarah, she could hear the irritation creeping into his voice. This is a big account. Spend a day with your daughter, she snapped. It won't kill you. I don't think this is fair, he spluttered. He seemed genuinely baffled as if Sarah had no business in life beyond taking care of Lucy and making things convenient for him. Is there something particular you need to do? She only had to hesitate a second or two. I joined a book group, she told him. We're reading Flaubert. <laughs> Based on the name alone, Sarah had developed a completely erroneous impression of the ladies' bellatristic society. She'd expected it to be stuffy and pretentious, fatally suburban, 
a garden club nightmare of watercress sandwiches and polite snobbery, well-preserved matrons and golf visors and pearls, to use the word darling as an adjective. Instead, the atmosphere inside Bridget's condo was warm and welcoming, full of laughter and intellectual curiosity. Over here, an informed conversation about the films of Mike Lee. Over there, an impassioned discussion of third world debt relief. Despite the age of the members, the ladies were in their 60s and 70s. Sarah sensed a collective vibrance in the air that seemed vaguely reminiscent of something she couldn't quite put her finger on. As the only little sister present, everyone kept assuring her that another was on the way. Sarah found herself in great demand. Jean ushered her around the room like a visiting celebrity, introducing her to each new arrival. Regina, a tall, bony woman with a hearing aid and an owlish smile. Alice, whose iron gray hair only emphasized the uncanny youthfulness of her face. And now Josephine, plump and frumpy, with a tight helmet of curly hair and mismatched orthopedic splints on her forearms. Oh no, said Jean, don't tell me you got carpal tunnel. Repetitive stress, Josephine replied with a sigh. Too much typing. She's writing a novel, Jean explained to Sarah. She always said she would. Josephine gave a rueful nod. Only 40 years behind schedule. This is Sarah, my neighbor, said Jean. She's a literary critic. In my dreams, said Sarah. In real life, I'm the mother of a three-year-old girl. An adorable three-year-old girl, added Jean. Josephine stared at Sarah for a long moment. There was something probing in her gaze, but tender, too, as if she were attempting to move beyond conversation into some more intimate realm. She won't be three forever, honey. When she goes to school, you can get back to your work. My work, said Sarah. The words felt good in her mouth. She just wished she knew what they referred to. Don't be like me. Josephine reached for Sarah's hand and gave a feeble, but somehow still encouraging squeeze. Don't let your whole life go by. Before Sarah could reply, Josephine was besieged by concerned friends, peppering her with questions and medical advice. Regina recommended acupuncture. Alice said she should try dictating her novel into a tape recorder. Bridget said she hoped Josephine's grip was strong enough to support a wine glass. Jean said she knew lots of people with similar injuries who had complete recoveries, no disability whatsoever. You just have to be patient, she said. And all at once it came to Sarah. It was like being back at the Women's Center. For the first time since she graduated from college, she'd managed to find herself, find her way into a community of smart, independent, supportive women who enjoyed each other's company and didn't need to compete with one another or define themselves in relation to the men in their lives. It was precisely what she'd been missing, the oasis she'd been unable to find in graduate school, at work, or even at the playground. She'd searched for it for so long that she'd even come su to suspect that it hadn't actually existed in the first place, at least not the way she remembered it, that it was more a product of her romantic undergraduate imagination than anything real in the world. But it had been real. It felt like this and it was a huge relief to be back inside the circle again. The feeling didn't last long. The doorbell rang, and Bridget escorted two more women into the room, both of them in, in expensive floral dresses. The older one had a pretty but somewhat leathery face and the toned legs of a tennis player. See, said Bridget, presenting the younger woman to Sarah with an air of triumph. I told you you'd have a comrade. Sarah tried to look pleased, but her face wouldn't cooperate. She just hoped her smile wasn't as stiff and phony as the one plastered on her comrade's face. Nice to see you again, said Sarah. What a surprise, said Marianne. We miss you at the playground. The two little sisters eyed each other warily across the coffee table. Sarah still hadn't recovered from the shock of Marianne's arrival and how completely it had spoiled what had been shaping up as a very nice evening. This couldn't be the women's center, not with her here. She felt like she'd been given a beautiful birthday present, only to have it ripped away a moment later and handed to someone else. Her only consolation was the look of raw discomfort on Marianne's face. 
She must have realized that she'd strayed onto alien turf, that for once she was the one who was outnumbered. Which one of you would like to start? asked Bridget. She's the bookworm, said Marianne. Let her go first. No, you go ahead, said Sarah. I can wait. Marianne took the measure of her audience before speaking. The ladies of the Bellatristic Society were smiling at her like kindergarten teachers overseeing the year's first installment of show and tell, fully prepared to be fascinated by a broken clamshell or a worn shoelace. Did anybody like this book? Marianne screwed her face up into a look of offended disapproval that Sarah knew well, because I really just hated it. She hesitated, waiting for someone to take the baton and run with it, but the ladies seemed startled by this unexpected salvo of negativity. They didn't look upset exactly, but their smiles were in retreat. I mean, isn't it kind of depressing, Marianne continued, her voice growing in confidence as if she were sitting at the picnic table on the playground, lecturing Cheryl and Teresa. She cheats on her husband with two different guys, wastes all his money, and kills herself with rat poison. Do I really need to read this? This question was met with an uncomfortable silence. It was Laurel, Mary Ann's sponsor, who ventured a response. There's a lot of good descriptive writing, she ventured hopefully, she said hopefully. The ladies nodded in vigorous agreement. It's supposed to be depressing, Josephine pointed out. It's a tragedy. <laughs> Emma's undone by a tragic flaw. What's her flaw, Bridget inquired. Blindness, Josephine replied. She can't see that the men are just using her. She just wants a little romance in her life, Jean ventured. You can't really blame her for that. It's about women's choices, Regina added. Back then, a woman didn't have a lot of choices. You could be a nun or a wife. That's all there was. Or a prostitute, added Bridget. She had a choice not to cheat on her husband, said Mary Ann, staring rudely at Sarah. Mary Ann's got a point, admitted Laurel. Usually it's the man who cheats, said Alice. I found it refreshing to read about a woman reclaiming her sexuality. Reclaiming her sexuality? Marianne repeated with disdain. Is that a nice way of saying she's a slut? Madame Bovary is not a slut, said Regina. She's one of the great characters in Western literature. Hello, said Marianne. She's sneaking off to the city every week to screw her husband's friends. I found some of the sex stuff a little cryptic, Josephine Page through her paperback, like here on page 216. Rodolphe discovered that the affair offered still further possibilities of sensual gratification. He abandoned every last shred of restraint and consideration. He made her into something compliant, something corrupt. See, said Marianne, she's a slut. Does anybody know what that means, Josephine asked. Do you think he's tying her up or something like that? Alice leaned forward and mouthed the words, anal sex. Josephine looked horrified. Really, she asked, glancing around the room in embarrassment. Did everyone get that but me? <laughs> Why don't we hold off on that for the moment, suggested Bridget. Let's see what our other little sister has to say. Back when she was teaching, the prospect of public speaking had filled Sarah with dread. She always felt like she was faking it, unsuccessfully impersonating an authority figure. But tonight, for some reason, she felt calm and well-prepared, an adult among her peers. Maybe she'd grown up in the past five or six years without realizing it. Or maybe she was just happier now than she'd been back then. She looked at Mary Ann with what she hoped was a kind of empathy. I think I understand your feelings about this book. I used to feel the same way myself. She shifted her gaze around the circle, making eye contact with each of the older women. It was okay being the center of attention. It was even kind of fun. When I read this book back in college, Madame Bovary just seemed like a fool. She marries the wrong man, makes one stupid mistake after another, and pretty much gets what she deserves. But when I read it this time, I just fell in love with her. Marianne scoffed, but the lady seemed intrigued. Jean smiled proudly. It was to remind everyone who was responsible for Sarah's presence at the meeting. 
My professors would kill me, she continued. But I'm tempted to go as far as to say that, in her own strange way, Emma Bovary is a feminist. Really? Bridget sounded skeptical, but open to persuasion. She's trapped, said Sarah. She can either accept a life of misery or struggle against it. She chooses to struggle. Some struggle, said Marianne. Jump in bed with every guy that says hello. She fails in the end, Sarah conceded. But there's something beautiful and heroic in her rebellion. How convenient, observed Marianne. So now cheating on your husband makes you a feminist. It's not the cheating, said Sarah. It's the hunger for an alternative, the refusal to accept unhappiness. I guess I just didn't understand the book, Marianne said, adopting a tone of mock humility. I just thought she looked so pathetic, degrading herself for nothing. I mean, did she really think a man like that was going to run away with her? Sarah couldn't help smiling. Just yesterday, for the first time, she and Todd had discussed the possibility of divorcing their respective spouses. Sarah had floated the subject cautiously after he told her about his miserable Sunday, Saturday at the beach, how he and Kathy had argued the whole time, how fragile and unhappy their marriage had become. She's losing patience with me, he confessed. I'm going to leave Richard, she replied. And then they had made love tenderly, almost fearfully, as if trying to absorb the meaning of what they just told each other. Madame Bovary's problem wasn't that she committed adultery, Sarah declared in a voice full of calm certainty. It was that she committed adultery with losers. She never found a partner worthy of her heroic passion. Mary Ann shook her head sadly, as if she pitied Sarah. But the other ladies were beaming, nodding in fervent, agree agree fervent agreement with this unexpected and thought-provoking assessment of the novel. Sarah sipped her wine, basking in the glow of their approval. Maybe I should go back to graduate school, she thought. Josephine raised her hand. Could we get back to the sex now, she asked. Thanks. Uh, thanks. I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Um, I'm trying to remember, but I think that the, the, the epigraph of the book comes from Madame Bovary, and I can't remember. It, I knew at some point that I was writing the book in the tradition of Madame Bovary. It's about you know uh, suburban adultery. Madame Bovary is the the, the prototypical book. I mean, wh what struck me as interesting was that Sarah is a very, very much a self-identified feminist, and so is. Um, Kind of interesting to have this, you know, post-feminist version of, of, of Madame Bovary. The, the very f epigraph of the book it reads, "I have a lover. I have a lover." She kept repeating to herself, reveling in the thought as though she were beginning a second puberty. And I feel like I, I must have read Madame Bovary, um, kind of as preparation for this book, and, and then uh, it, it just kind of got stuck in my head. And it seemed like a funny way to. Um, it, it seemed like a great way. First of all, to have Sarah, to see Sarah's rationalization for wh what she was up to, um, and to have this comic face-off with with Marianne, who's you know very judgmental, um, and to see in a way how Sarah, as a feminist and as a you know a, a, an intellectual, would rationalize um, something that she disapproved of. Basically, she disapproves of her own actions in some sense, in the same way that she 
would have disapproved of Madame Bovary before, but now she's there. She sees this as a shock for happiness. And so I, I just wanted to, um, it seemed like a good opportunity to see her thinking it through. How is she going to live with this decision that she herself, you know, in a vacuum would have disapproved of? You know, and so Madame Bovary becomes a vehicle for her to discuss that. And so she's saying, okay, I'm not being weak and I don't need a man to save me from my unhappiness. I'm being a feminist by rebelling against the, uh, uh, you know, lack of choices in my life. So it, it um, you know, I mean, first of all, it needs to be a comic scene for me. Um, and I, I, I did want to write about book groups because they seem like such an important part of suburban and literary landscape. So that was, that was something. Um, but I, I, I can't remember how much was planned. I think a lot of times what happens is it takes so long to write a novel that you have an idea and several months, and you say, oh, I'm going to write a book group scene. But maybe that's all you say. And then you get your character into the book group and you suddenly realize what, what it's an opportunity to do. So I certainly didn't imagine um, you know, I didn't know exactly what, why, what was going to happen at the book group until I got there, I think. Um, that's my answer. Oh, one more in over there. Yeah, but yeah, I guess probably both, and in, in because it's so appealing to me. I mean, to, you know, I guess for every writer, there, there's something that you recognize as an idea that that you can work with. You know, um, so I, I, I like this idea of you know, election was a kind of a you know mock epic or something like that, where where you take something that it seems really silly. I, I mean, I like the idea of taking things that seem really silly and then making them carry a, a lot more weight than you think they could. I mean, that seems like a, a good surprise for, for the reader. You know, I thought, you know, I think I, I mentioned the last time, I wanted to write a political novel, and, and there are some writers who immediately say, okay, I'm going to write, you know, All the King's Men. I'm going to write about an actual political figure and, and make it an incredibly literary book and, and um, you know, book that, that has a kind of epic quality and says everything that I might know about politics. And, and uh, when, I, when I think like that, I, my heart immediately sinks and I think I, there's no way I can write anything of epic dimension. You know, I'm, I'm just afraid of it. Um, it. I also don't have a real taste for that sort of thing personally. So uh, I, I immediately am drawn to the microcosm to, to get my ideas across in as small I mean, and you know, occasionally, critics will um, use this dismissive term "miniaturist," um, and, and my feelings would be hurt. But I think there's something true about it. Um, I, I really do like the smallest possible um, canvas that, that, that I can find, um, and I think partly there. Because if, if you have epic ambitions, you have to deliver on them, and mostly people don't. But if you have really small ambitions, I think you can surprise people with, you know, making them care about something they didn't think they could care about, making them um, care about characters they didn't think they could care about. You know, I, I think there's something, I mean, the flip side of that for me in terms of critics, a lot of critics I noticed have started to use the word sly, that there's something sly about, you know, m my work. And I don't think of myself as a sly person. It doesn't seem like a very flattering thing to be. 
But I think I understand what they mean. It, 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 at first, a lot of what I do seems absurd or, or ridiculous. And I think by the end, it, it has made a serious claim uh, on the reader. So, and, and I think that what your, what your question was referring to in a way was, was that how that process works. Um, so even though I, the idea on the surface may look silly, I may have a kind of much more serious um, purpose behind it. And, and, and it's not like those two are mismatched. They're, they're matched given my, my purpose. If that makes any sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> You know, uh, reaching that point in their lives where they're they're sort of freed up from the demands of their husbands, and, and they are kind of recreating a you know a, a collegiate world, and and Sarah is, is happy there. I mean, uh, there have definitely been people who have felt that it was weird. There's one it was in the New Criterion of all places, a very conservative journal, where someone really talked about that scene and said, you know, these people are stupid um, from the way that they talk, and you know. I'm actually very, as a writer, I'm really interested in the way people talk about books that they read. And people don't often talk about books on the level that you get in, in the college course. You know, and I go to book groups sometimes where people have, have read my work, and it's, there's often a lot of frustration among people who are like Sarah, who have some literary training with the, the level of, of the discussion. You know, and and um, I, I didn't think these characters were particularly stupid. I think people use books for their own purposes. Well, Sarah, you get the thing to know about Sarah is that she is um, very smart and extremely depressed. I mean, she when you find her at the beginning of the book, she, um, you know, there, there's real self-loathing there. I mean, she has found herself in a place that she didn't want to be. She doesn't quite know how she got there. She feels like she has betrayed herself. So, you know, I, I think in that sense, you know, you see her at a moment like this, and, and she's clearly, you know, rationalizing. But I think, you know... I think, you know, I think people do it. I mean, we all do it, especially in those moments when we're under a lot of pressure and doing things that, um, you know, we're surprised by in a bad way, <laughs> unpleasantly surprised by, you know. Um, so, but that, that edge between, you know, I, I think, you know, often I write in a way that looks like satire, um, but but isn't isn't really, you know, and, and that, that's another you know, sort of line that I'm, I'm often playing with. And I think if you cross it in a certain way, people can't take the characters seriously. So the, the issue is, you know, for me, trying to get as close as I can and not cross it. And I think sometimes for some readers, I do cross it, you know, and that's that issue of are you laughing at these characters, you know, or do you feel kind of 
sympathy for them? And, or, or does that, is that un, an unstable process throughout the book? You know, sometimes you're feeling like, oh, I see through this character. Sometimes you're like, oh, oh I, I totally feel with her at this moment. Yeah, no, the, the, those are two good questions. Um, you know, I was surprised in a way at the, you know, the child molester is a guy named Ronnie in this book, and, and um, he's kind of a sad sack guy, uh, but he's also quite clearly, you know, capable of, of um, you know, scary, violent behavior. And I, I really thought when I wrote it that that, that was going to be the way the book was presented to the public. It is a novel about a suburban town up in arms about a child molester. That seemed to me, in a way, to overwhelm the, the story of the affair, which is at, at the center of it. <laughs> I thought I was free. Um, but but in, a, in a way, uh, it didn't. It, it, it got embraced as a kind of satire of, of suburbia. And, and there hasn't been a whole lot of critical, um, I mean, if you looked at, at, at just the reviews overall, you'd find that maybe, you know, this, there, there are reviews that don't even mention him or mention him in one sentence. Um, what, what happened for me is that, that he came late to the book and added this really crucial element, I think, really explained to me what the book was about, because it's a lot about characters who, his desire kind of places them beyond the, the community in a way. Um, but I didn't want to write about a child molester. You know, I think there are writers like A.M. Holmes today who really are interested in extreme states of mind and, and you know, really sordid material. And, and, and I'm just not. And so when I realized I had this character in the book, I thought, how am I going to present him in a way that, that I can feel with as a writer. And, and the way that I chose was to have him live with his mother. He's out of prison and he's back home living with his mom. And basically he's treated in the book as a middle-aged man who's living at home with his mother. Um, his sexual problems uh, are referred to, they're, they're not you know hidden under the rug, but basically the primary way you see it is through his mother's eye as, as a a guy who has no life whatsoever. And his mother is worried that she's not going to be around forever to care for him, and she wants him to get a girlfriend. So the first time you see him, for instance, uh, there, she, she's trying to get him to put in a, per a personal ad in the paper so she can find a girlfriend. And to me, it's a very funny scene on the one hand. Again, it feels like a satire if you just describe it. So there's a scene where a woman is trying to get a child molester to put a personal ad in the paper. Um, but it's actually quite a poignant scene because it's from the mother's perspective. And you see this kind of desperate hope on her part that somehow her problem child can you know, fi find a way to live a normal life. Um, so I think that was, he, he looks sympathetic mainly because you see him th through the mother's eyes. Um, by the time the book is over, you do get into his head directly. But again, at a very sympathetic moment a moment that pretty much any reader could um, could imagine. It's a universal moment. And, and so uh, it, I did stack the deck in his favor in that, in that sense. But, but if you just look at what he says and does in the book, he's a very unpleasant guy. Um, as for the second one, um, the, the movie question, that, that's a really interesting one to me. After Election came out, um, I thought a lot about 
movies, and, and I, I, when I wrote Joe College, my next book, I thought, I, I really stuck in my head, uh, am I trying to write this so that it becomes a movie, or, or am I just writing the book I want to write? Because there's this uh, subplot where the, the kid is a Yale student from working class New Jersey, and his father drives a lunch truck, and he goes home at spring break to drive the lunch truck, and there are these thugs who are you know, possibly mob connected who are trying to take over the father's lunch truck business. And it's like almost like a subplot out of The Sopranos. And I thought, am, am I putting this in here because I think it'll be cinematic, or, or does it belong here? And I ended up leaving it. I felt like it, it belonged and, and became an integral part of the book. But I, I, I was worried about that. And with this book, I said, you know, I'm just going to write a book, the book that I want to write. I thought it was going to be so dark, you know, with this child molester um, with, you know, Richard Sarah's husband who goes very deep into the world of internet porn. There's just a lot of stuff that I thought, you know, nobody's going it, it has doesn't have a single character who would be considered sympathetic in, in the Hollywood sense. Um, but oddly enough, you know, it, it got optioned and it probably has a better chance of being made into a movie than anything else. I'm, I'm working on it with um, Todd Field, who did In the Bedroom, and, and we finished the script and he's looking for actors now. And if anybody finds the right actors, that way they'll get made. And, and it'll be made, I think, pretty faithfully. So it's, it's funny in that way, I think. Um, the best way is just to leave all that aside and write the, the book that I want to write. Um, it, this was a, a question that, a challenge that really worried me earlier in my writing career. My, my first book, Bad Haircut, was very much like a boy's book. It's about a boy growing up, and it's really about male friendship, and it's about violence, and it's about sex. And, and when I started to move towards a novel, I, I you know, was very pointedly aware of the fact that I hadn't really written a, a, a well-rounded female character. And when I got to the lecture, and I, I, I knew I had to. I, I just had this, the story kind of, as it became clear to me, the, the two of the main characters. The election doesn't really have a main character. It, it trades off with seven different voices. And, but two of the really important characters are Tracy Flick, the character that Reese Witherspoon plays in the movie. But, but more important to me is Tammy Warren, the, the, the lesbian character. Um, and, and I remember being a little bit paralyzed. I thought, like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to write this character? Um, and the way that I ultimately did it was to make her more like me than any other character in the book. Um, I really gave her like all the high school alienation that I had. So that in some kind of inner, inner way that I felt really, I felt like I really knew her. Um, and once I, that once I kind of knew her inner emotional state, you know, the, the external details weren't hard to come by. I actually feel like for the character, um, it's the voice, it's kind of just the emotional response to things that makes them real. Um, and Sarah in this book is, I think, very much a kind of cousin to Tammy. You know, she also, in the first chapter, you find out that, you know, one of the most important relationships in her life is a, a lesbian relationship that she had in college. Um, she still considers herself a person of sort of ambiguous sexuality. Um, but I also, I gave her, in the way that I gave Tammy this alienation that I felt in high school, I gave Sarah this sort of academic history that, that I had sort of uh, shared. And, you know, some of the details are different, but I felt, I felt very much like I knew her, I knew women like her. I, I wasn't, um, wasn't so daunted by that. And, and then there's just that kind of actorly thing where you get into the character's skin. And, and um, once that happens, I don't, I, I didn't feel ever like, oh, how would a woman, you know, I think you'd go crazy if you do, like, how would a woman react, right? It's never how would a woman react, it's how would Sarah react? And if you know Sarah, then it's not a problem. Um, obviously, your knowledge of, you know, women in general will, will, will come to bear on this. But, um, it, you know, once I make that, that leap where I feel like I know the character, then it's, it's not even a, a, a problem. And, and in fact, she was she was much easier to write than some of the other 
the other characters. And, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm, I'm writing a, a new book now, and then, you know, the main character is a woman as well, and I'm not sure. Um, yeah, and I was really considered like a guide writer my, my first year, so that sort of did have a, a certain, you know, evolution. And, and, and I'm not sure what it is about, about these main characters that I'm so interested in right now, but um, it's, it's just that's where I'm looking at. Well, thanks so much. I really enjoyed coming here.